I'm back in plenary session, virtual edition. I'm joined by EBM Room, an evidence-based medicine rheumatologist. His name is Dr. Mike Putman. He is an assistant professor at the Medical College of Wisconsin, my favorite city on the, on the Great Lake. No, that's not true. It's Chicago. <laughs> it's my second favorite city, although they do have some great brew probs. Mike, it's a pleasure to have you join us. This is going to be a reverse interview. I should let the audience know. You're going to be interviewing me. I'm in the hot seat here because I guess apparently some things I said have... Uh, have caught some people's ire. So Mike, you take it away. You you let them know what we're up to here. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you for having me. It's an, it's an honor to be on plenary session. So yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited uh, too. Yeah. I, so we, I, did, we did not prepare, right? We don't know what's we going on. Okay. No, right. you, you heard that I might <laughs> grill you on Twitter, but you don't know anything past that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, full disclosure for the audience, we're both part of the Adam Sifu tree. So if this is a disaster, oh. We can blame Adam and, and not most Adam. things in life. You can blame Adam. I think that's fair. <laughs> yeah. So, so you trained under Adam as well. Yeah. I was a resident at university of Chicago um, and a medical student there. And so his fourth year class on reading papers kind of kicked off a lot of what I'm doing today. So I have a lot of, I have a lot of gratitude to him. Yeah. And I would say pretty much exactly quote unquote, same thing. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's kick it off. You know, I, I, I do have some, I, I do want to ask you some more challenging questions, but I, I do have to thank you. I learned a lot from your work, uh, science communication and meta research and such. And um, I have to say your early advocacy for, uh, for children during the pandemic was much appreciated. I think that I was too cowardly to say things out loud that I was thinking. And I think the the results have been, been, been rough to, to see how much learning loss has occurred. So thanks for talking about that. Yeah. And that's still a sore subject. I'm a, I have a vendetta on that issue and we're going to be publishing so many papers on this. And the crux of the issue for the audience who don't know is basically, you know, most of what my opinion is most of what we did to children, particularly prolonged school closure was a net decrement to their lives and well being. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I had little kids, and when the pandemic kicked off, I could immediately see that Zoom learning was essentially worthless. And uh, you know, as someone who's taking care of people who um, come from less advantaged backgrounds and um, have less resources, it was immediately obvious to me where this the the hurt from this was going to fall. And so uh, it's been frustrating to see, but I think that's finally a lot of information is coming out on that. But that's a topic for a different day because I don't okay. think we have much disagreement there. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I want to. This is actually happening because I have have had a small habit the past couple of weeks of trying to get people to debate you because someone will complain about something you said on Twitter. And then I will say, you know, I bet you actually agree about something. Um, and I bet it'd be useful to hear you two talk. And then they will say that they will not do it. And then you said, why don't you just come do it yourself? And so that's why I'm here. Uh, and then, you know, it's interesting. And, and, and it's also an open invitation. Anyone listening, you want to debate. And maybe Mike will come and he'll, you know, we need somebody to referee it. Maybe Mike will do it, you know? So if you yeah. disagree on any of substantive issue, uh, let us know. I love moderating debates because I disagree with everybody. So it works pretty well. <laughs> I like it. I like it too, because the moderator's job is just to let the audience get a sense of what people think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So a couple things. So first, <laughs> how does it feel being this controversial about things? I don't know if you actually expected that or is this just okay because you're used to it from oncology? Yeah, you know, I guess I would, to be perfectly honest with you, is that my goal is not to be controversial. And I think that's a mistake yeah. that my critics make, which is that he only holds the position because he's seeking to be controversial. The yeah. truth is, whether you agree with me or not, I truly believe what I'm telling you. The difference mm -hmm. is that my filter level uh, in terms of telling you what I'm thinking is low. It's not zero, actually. I do, you know, obviously, if it was zero, you'd really be getting, you know, a lot out there. It's not zero. It's just probably lower than most academics. And I guess I set out in academia, maybe deliberately, but maybe personality wise, with sort of a lower filter. I was in cancer medicine. I think a lot of what we do, I still think a lot of what we do is just crazy. I mean, we're spending $100,000 a year on drugs that, ha you know, half of them we don't even know they improve survival. And when they do, we know it only works a few weeks in a select cohort. I mean, that's crazy to me. It's a society like bankrupting itself on drugs that may not work. I don't think you need to know a lot to, you know, just common sense would tell you that's crazy. But in oncology, it's quite provocative because, you know, a lot of people benefit from the system. And so it has been perceived as controversial. Uh, COVID-19 is the same. I think a lot of my points of view are a lot of people agree with. It's just perceived as controversial because particularly Twitter has its certain, you know, center of gravity, which is not where the center of America is. Yeah, I do. I do research to some degree on, on pharmaceutical influence and rheumatology. And I've yeah. talked a lot about that. And it, it's kind of controversial, but it's funny because I think a lot of doctors agree 
but uh, the system just keeps be getting perpetuated. So agreement and then change are kind of kind of different. Well and put. You know, another thing I want to do before we chat and start, Ben Mazer put this out on Twitter a little while ago. I really like Ben in general. And he is there's entry criteria for talking about COVID. I want to run his entry criteria by you. I asked him and he couldn't remember them, but he said that he was certain they were very witty and intelligent. So I think there is something like the first one being um, have millions of people worldwide died from COVID-19. And I mean, I think I can agree with that. And would you of agree course. with that? Absolutely. Yeah, obvious, right? Obvious. Check. And the second one, did the veterans, and we're going to specify the initial course, save millions of lives worldwide. I mean, do you Ab feel comfortable with that? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, particularly uh, older people. Yeah. But I'll put a big asterisk, which is it could have saved even more lives had it been delivered properly, which we could talk about. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a lot of interesting debate that happened earlier on the pandemic about spacing shots that could have yes. helped a lot, um, getting them out quicker, which yes. is- uh, Especially controversial and uh allocation uh i think all three of those could have been better yes, but yes yes we, yes we don't need to get too much into that today but okay so i think that it's worth noting for everyone listening that both of us agree wholeheartedly on both of those things and uh, there's still a lot of useful things to talk about can i add one thing some people yeah. will say some people always say like you know i currently ask for randomized trials of bivalent boosters they say the randomized controlled trials of the original vaccine they you know they didn't show x y or z but let's just recap what they showed. One, they showed a substantive reduction in symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. And two, they also showed in randomized fashion a tremendous reduction in severe disease. So you mm -hmm. had both those data points. So I think that's something people don't know. Now, obviously, they didn't measure transmission, blah, blah, blah. But that was pretty good data. And it still mm -hmm. is pretty good data. And it's particularly good data for January 2021 and December 2020. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the, the Kaplan-Meier curve from those trials was just astonishing. Astonishing. Yeah. You don't often see that kind of divergence between two curves. And when you do, you're, you get excited. You say, this is a... But that's exactly where I want to start off. And this is the thing that provoked the most recent me trying to get someone to debate you. Uh, was a post that you had. And this is the title of your, your post. I'm going to quote, no more COVID-19 boosters without evidence. You too can pledge no more shots without RCT. So I, I should say up front that I did not sign it and I did not have plans to. Um, but I want to open by hearing you convince me that I should. Why should I Why should I sign this pledge? Okay. So um, I, I'm assuming uh, that you're in the 30s or 40s. Maybe we'll leave it a bit vague like that. So you yeah, have to say your age. Sure. Okay. Yeah. You're in your 30s and 40s and you have no underlying medical problems. You've probably had between one and three doses of vaccine and you've probably had COVID once or twice. Is any of that accurate? Three times confirmed. Yeah, actually quite a lot. <laughs> you've had COVID three times. Yes. <laughs> and you've also had and multiple times. doses of vaccine. Multiple doses of vaccine. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> honestly, this is the same. Okay. There's two reasons to prescribe a vaccine. The one reason that's different is that if me vaccinating you provides a substantive benefit to third parties, then, you know, sort of, if it's more or less neutral for you, but there's a substantive benefit to third parties, maybe there's a compelling sort of societal case to do that. But I think it's abundantly clear that that is not the case. You can boost, you know, a t first of all, when, you, when we have these indefinite booster policies, we're going to have a yearly booster. You're gonna, you can boost as much as you want, as many, you know, you can boost as much as you want. You're only going to be boosting a few hundred million people globally, the richest people. We're not going to be boosting sub-Saharan Africa. We're not going to boost India. We're not going to be boosting, you know, many of these places. So you're going to boost a few hundred million people globally for a vaccine that, you know, does not halt transmission, that may transiently reduce spread. You've got 8 billion people globally. You've got 100 billion human interactions a day. Me vaccinating you is not going to put, it's like spitting in the ocean. You know, we're not going to, people always say like the benefit to others is we slow variant creation or transmission. This is all nonsense. It's not only unproven, but it's also defies basic logic that vaccinating the rich inhabitants of one nation in a global society will do that. Then the next question is, okay, so let's put that aside. I, I personally believe there is no benefit to you, to others, to keep boosting you. Then the next question is, it's no different than giving you a statin or an antihypertensive, which is, do the benefits outweigh the risks? And I guess the reason you should take the pledge is, you do know the risks. The risks are, you know, something in the ballpark of one in 10 to 50K risk of myocarditis. That's the safety signal. Even at your age, maybe one in 50K, you know, on the third or fourth dose. Um, at a younger age, it's gonna be higher, one in 10K in the highest cohort. It's not zero. 
And what's the benefit? The benefit is a delta reduction in hospitalization. Your risk of being hospitalized from subsequent SARS-CoV-2, you know, I mean, we're talking about one 10 to the power of six or 10 to the power of seven. So for me, even if you assume this booster is magical, the risk benefit calculus tips in favor of harm. That's one point. The second point is we're assuming we, they've never generated randomized evidence that the bivalent booster reduces severe disease or hospitalization. So I guess I would say the pledge um, is basically, I have the same pledge for chemotherapy. To be honest, I pledge that I will not take chemotherapy unless you prove to me that there's a net benefit for me. And I have the same pledge for boosters and I have the same pledge for statins and, you know, but, you know, those have better evidence. Hypertensives have better evidence. Um, okay, so that's the gist of my argument. Yeah, so let me let me take that on two different points. The first is that, you know, I think that the data for a myocarditis signal in younger men is pretty well established, but that really peters off. And I think that my personal risk there, um, you know, those confidence intervals are so wide. I mean, I, it's hard for me to imagine that that risk is even well established at one in 50,000, could be even smaller than that. Um, and so I, I think that's a pretty small risk. Um, okay. So you say maybe one in 10, one in a hundred K? Yeah, maybe. And I okay. mean, as you get older, it seems to vanish, at least from the data that I've seen. Absolutely. Um, it goes down with age. And, you know, I, it's hard for me to imagine that an older patient, um, and actually let me just quote from you from this uh, recent editorial. I was going to give you this later, but we'll do it now. So this is a Paul Offit editorial from earlier in February. And he said, and this is the quote, he said, uh, booster dosing is probably best reserved for the people most likely to need protection against severe disease, specifically older adults, people with multiple coexisting conditions that put them at high risk for serious illness and those who are immunocompromised. And when I, when I heard your pledge, my immediate thought were my patients, I mean, I treat giant cell arteritis, I'm a vasculitis specialist, and, and I was thinking about my patients and saying, I really don't want them signing this pledge. And so do you disagree with Paul Offit's position there? Because I know that you've been favorable towards what he said in the past. But if I recall, he's saying those most likely benefit are. Yeah, those most likely to need protection. Yeah, yeah. He said this best reserved for people most likely to need protection. Here's against... what he doesn't say. Yeah. Randomized control trials have established that it works. You and did not. Yes. Okay, <laughs> because they haven't. And so here's what I would say to you and to Paul Offit. Um, Pfizer and Moderna made $100 billion off these products. Yeah. They, they want to keep approving it based on no data. Whose job is it in society to put some pressure on them to demand data? In my opinion, it would be Marion Gruber and Phil Krause. They were the deputy director and FDA. They resigned. Why? Because the White House told them they cannot put that pressure on the company. Because the White House has asked them to approve based on what they deem insufficient evidence. They've resigned. So now we have Peter Marks. Peter Marks is, by the way, What's his training? People always say, oh, you're an oncologist. What do you know about vaccines? Peter Marks is an oncologist. He's an oncologist. The only yeah. difference is, unlike me, he never published that many papers when he was, he, you know, he's not that, I mean, you know, okay, he's not a real, uh, in my opinion, he doesn't really know evidence-based medicine. So here's my point. I mean, my counter argument is, why do we have to make a pledge? There's, the FDA has abdicated their duty. Their duty was, they need to make Pfizer and Moderna do these randomized trials. The reasons they don't do the randomized trials, one, it costs too much money. Obviously, that's not a reason. They got too much money in their pockets. Two, it takes too long. But the reason that doesn't work anymore is, as you see, the bivalent booster uptake is 14%. So, you know, you can't say it takes too long when people are not persuaded by vaccine, you know, antibody titer data and eight mice. Um, so that, you know, so I guess part of why I'll go back to your patients and I take care of hemolignancy people. And I totally agree with you that all things being equal, if I had to give the booster out, who am I going to give it to? It's the person B cell deplete, the person with giant cell arteritis, the person who's 85 years old in a nursing home. That's who I would give it to. And that's who Paul would give it to. And I think it's very reasonable, it, given the data we have now, to really focus on that population. Okay. So, uh, but at the same yeah. time, we need, we need to force the manufacturer to generate the data. And not doing that is, is, is criminal, I think. Okay. I, I have a prudential con concern and a practical concern. Yes. Though. Minute. But let me let me rewind and just give you the extreme side of this. So do you think that like a 75 year old patient with multiple comorbidities who's been vaccinated before um, and has maybe had COVID once and is on some immunosuppression, but not that much, you know, the kind that I give, not the kind that you give. Yeah, uh, okay. Do you think that that patient benefits from boosting? Do you think that they would benefit? I just I, I honestly, I don't know the answer to that question. Because I mean, they're they're on the cusp. That's probably like, yeah. yeah.
But, I think that's. I think that may be uh, one place where we certainly disagree. I, mean, I think that there's almost certainly some benefit for that patient, and this is where I think we get more into the value of observational research. Let's here. talk there, about there, it. there is observational data on this. I mean, it's been published in all the best journals, the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, and it shows a thirty to forty percent vaccine efficacy for boosting as compared to the prior ones and the monovalent. So, you know, I mean, I think that there is observational data that suggests that. And for me, where my prior here is that. It, it would be very, very surprising to me if there'd be no benefit to boosting. Um, and then you give me a little bit of observational data uh, that supports that prior and lands about where I thought it would be. I mean, it wouldn't, the reduction certainly would never be as large as the initial ones going from zero to 60, you know, and vaccination is much different than going from, you know, 40 to 60. Right. Uh, but you know, it, it, my prior was that there would be a benefit for that person. The observational data shows that. And I, I feel and, like and you have put, just put a point more there. The here than you should. Okay. Yeah. The observational data, the 30% you're quoting is for symptomatic SARS-CoV-2. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Severe disease, confidence intervals even wider. It is. Yeah. Okay. The next thing I'd say is here's why all these data are flawed. The reason I don't trust these data that much. Out of a hundred people who are 75, who are like the picture, who's the one who's rushing to get the fourth dose? You know, they're white, they're well-educated, they're richer, they live in the suburbs, they know who to call, they look on WebMD, they eat quinoa, uh, you know, they, uh, <laughs> you know, they drive a Volvo, they have, go to, you know, they, they're parts of golf clubs and yoga studios, they wear a Biden hat, uh, they don't go to red states, they, you know, okay, I mean, so my point is that there is a severe confounding in these data sets. Uh, it's true in Israel, where they may be even people of different, um, uh, ethnic background, socioeconomic status. It's true in America. So I put him an asterisk there. But if you really, you know, pressure, if I mean, if the real question is, given the shitty data we have now, what do I, what would I actually advise your patient? I'd say, you know what, the downside is practically zero. You're 75. Just go ahead and do it, whatever. You know, we don't know. I mean, that's probably all things being equal. But I want to pick a separate point here, which is that this should not be the situation. It's absolutely unacceptable. This company is making $10 billion from these products. I mean, what are we talking about? The same people, okay, this is my point to you. The same people on Twitter, Aducanumab, what a fleecing of America. The data is shitty. That's a very similar situation. You, in fact, we could say, one, these are super old people with Alzheimer's. They've got nothing to lose. They've got nothing to lose. I mean, many of them have severe Alzheimer's. What's the downside of giving them a drug that doesn't help them with Alzheimer's? You know, you know what I mean? Educanumab also makes their brain swell up. Like it's not <laughs> yeah, that the, yeah. there's a there's a difference in the side effect profile. But it's also rare, and you know, but but you see, my point is that in no, both cases point, they fail. We're, yeah. yeah, okay, difference of degree. But no, I, I think that that's well taken, which is that at the end of the day, talking to that patient that I'm concerned about who sees your pledge and says, I don't want to get vaccinated, you would tell them that it probably is reasonable to get vaccinated. And my pledge is specifically is no more doses, okay, until randomized trials prove that it works for my age, uh, my, my mate, my profile. And, okay. and, and the other thing I want to point out is it is different because at some point, even you're going to change your tune. Okay, here's why. Uh, the bivalent booster is currently the parent BA45 in Wuhan. Okay, that's the 50-50. Yeah. Next year, what is it going to be? The year after, what is it going to be? And then the final point I'll make to you is that Peter Marks himself wrote a jam of viewpoint at the end of last year where he has conceded my point that to do subsequent years, you're going to have to do randomized control trials power for severe disease. So even he this has acknowledged that I think, you know, okay, anyway, point well taken. No, I, I will agree with you wholeheartedly that we should be running trials. I've been in a couple of Twitter chats recently about this saying that we need we need trials for this and we should be powering them to look at meaningful endpoints. So we're, my, we're in agreement there. Okay. And my but, opponents, uh, okay, we will talk about masking trials, but let's come back on this issue. <laughs> the 20, what about the 20-year-old? Right yeah. now, the Biden administration says if you're a seven-month-old baby, you need bivalent booster. If you're a 20-year-old college kid and you had COVID, you need a bivalent booster. Let me ask you. You got a 20-year-old kid in your, in your clinic. He's a rower. He's big. He's strapping. He got three doses so he could go to, you know, a liberal arts school <laughs> in the Northeast. And he had COVID twice. Okay, okay. he had COVID twice. And he's asking, they got a requirement that I got to get the bivalent booster. Or let's say there's no requirement. As a doctor, do you really think it's in his medical best interest to get that bivalent booster? 
I think it's about a wash. Um, I mean, a 20 year old healthy person who's had COVID as many times as I have and has been vaccinated as many times as I have, you know, I, I think it's probably a wash for that person. I think that the, the myocarditis risk for a 20 year old man is real and present. And um, it's one in 10K. That's Katie Scharf's Kaiser Permanente paper. Yeah. Do you think that that's the same risk with boosting and subsequent that, that, dosing? So that's for the third dose. That is for the third dose. Yeah. Okay. For, for the first two doses, it's one in 3,500 for second dose Moderna on day 28. Going down. Yeah. Right. It goes down. Okay. But Which makes my sense. point is the only thing that you and I are slightly apart on is I think it's a net, like you're phys actually doing harm to that man on average. Yeah, sure. sure. So, so we're, we're so close, but our, you know, our needle is a little bit off. Or, you know, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we're too far away on, in that population. But so let me move to somewhere where I think we are far away in. And that's the practical question and the prudential question. So the practical question for me here, you know, I started doing research and writing, you know, snarky editorials about pharma. And, you know, in particular, I was all fired up about this Boringer Ingelheim drug. And um, one of my friends when I was in fellowship reached out and said, hey, you know, the, the BI people, they, they mentioned you last week. I was like, oh. I'm getting to them. And he's like, yeah, they just said that you have a funny perspective. And I was like, kind of kind of insulted. And then I said, oh, well, why were you talking to BI? He's like, I'm on their speakers bureau now. And I was like, oh, why why are you doing that? And he's like, well, they give me $13,000 a year. And I was like, okay, so they're going to ignore me. They're going to make fun of me. They're going to pay all my friends to talk for them. And so the practical question here is like, do, do, do you think you're going to move the needle on a, on a pledge? I mean, I, and I love the optimism, but um practically do we think we're going to be able to get them to run these trials i guess it's a broader question beyond the pledge which is my whole body of work i mean really yeah. two books all the papers i do they're all on the same i mean there's no difference in the theme i'm always saying and the people are like oh he's got a new tune randomized trial. i've all oh, i'm always saying the same yeah. and so my question about the needle is it's a deep it's a philosophical question uh i do believe that me being in the world in medicine has pushed the needle on these issues in a lot of ways. I think it's not easy. And I think you're absolutely right. And somebody on my own research team said like, you're never gonna change your mind on COVID. We should focus on oncology. And I'm like, but we're not changing any, we're changing minds in oncology? Look, I mean, it's as bad as it ever was. Okay, but that's what they said, you know? And um, I mean, it's really a tough question, but I do think Mike, and I also think there's a separate, another layer up, which is that I think if you're gonna be a professor, I'm a professor. I got a duty to like professorship that if I genuinely believe something is the case, I got to speak my mind. I got to tell my truth. My truth is, you know, I would advise that 20 year old not to do it. The 75 year old, I would say, yeah, probably do it. But again, I think I should put pressure on the company. I guess that's my truth. And I have a duty. Otherwise, why did I be a professor? Why don't I just go private practice? I mean, why am I even in this line of work to keep quiet on these things? You know what I mean? So I think that's sort of like a meta thing I think about. Anyway. I think I think both those resonate with me. I mean, I feel like slowly chipping away in the right direction is a very valuable thing to do, even if sometimes it feels futile. But I think that there's there's a I think it's in particular the you know I think you probably can move the needle on things, um, and you know the question of why are you here anyway unless you're going to do these sorts of things really resonates with me. And it's part of what's so aggravating about no one being willing to debate you on Twitter because you know the people would say, well, we don't want to platform him, and I'm like, well, you and I have like four thousand followers, you know, you're. you're He's platforming you. Exactly. This is so silly. Like, what are you doing not going on to debate him? Like, if you have ideas, go do it. But and, uh, and, and just one more point on this issue. Yeah. When I was talking about school closure, you know, they demonized me for that. Now they've all changed their tune. They've acknowledged that I might have been right, you know, and they will acknowledge on this issue, too. I mean, that's also what motivates me. Yeah, I believe that. Let me share you an observation I've had on that, which is sad to me, which is that, you know, there's there's been a lot of like pandemic retrospecting. And I don't think people remember whether or not you were correct. They remember whether or not you they agreed with you at the time. And I think that that's a real problem with like pandemic accountability. I, I enjoyed Emily Oster's essay about, you know, and the pandemic amnesty. amnesty. Yeah. But at, at the same time, I feel like um, we need to acknowledge who said what, when, and like, and actually grapple with what they said at the time, as opposed to whether or not we have this vague sense that they're on the right or wrong side of things. That's why but I keep um, a, a pinned tweet with all my op-eds and the date. Yeah. You, you check the date and you see what you think, you know, that's why I do it. But yeah. yeah. And I like that. I think that's very transparent. All right. And then last, last question about this particular topic before we argue more about observational data. And uh, that, that is just that there's a 
prudential question here. And I, I think that my 70 some year old patient would benefit from being boosted. And I practice in a politically diverse area. And uh, I think that um, pledges and things of this nature make it harder to encourage boosting in people for whom I am confident there is a benefit. And so do you worry about the prudential side of this where you know, being out there and um, having a pledge like this may move the needle or get people thinking, but you know, the net cost to the population of people deciding not to be vaccinated, I think very well might be substantial. And I, I worry about pledges like this contributing to that and in, in, in a way that actually harms people. So what's your response to that, that argument? Here's Vinay Prasad's pledge. And here's, I'll put in this other, this, I'm putting a tiny little dot. And then here's this universe. Here's what's in the universe of what's going to destroy vaccine confidence. One, the CDC ha lied about natural immunity. If you have COVID and recover, you're much less likely to develop severe disease. Number two, they never made the manufacturer Pfizer Moderna run randomized trials in people who have recovered. They could have, we could have done also randomized trials in people who've recovered to see additional doses help. Number three, the Biden administration decided that boosters have to be for 12 year old boys and 82 year old women. They didn't just focus. That was a conscious decision that Paul Offit disagreed with, Marion Gruber and Phil Krauss disagreed with. Um, number four, when asked about myocarditis, Rochelle Walensky said, we have looked for a signal in 100 million cases, we haven't seen one. Number five, even though they knew about myocarditis, they never tried to lower the doses. They never tried to space it apart. They never banned Moderna in this country. Number six, when we knew about VIT, we didn't ban J&J. &J. So I guess my point is, is that, you know, you have to be, I mean, I'm a speck in the universe. I mean, you know, maybe people on Twitter think I, you know, but I'm not the CDC and FDA. These errors by public institutions are going to really rob confidence. I actually think I'm, the path to rebuilding confidence is to acknowledge exactly what we talked about, that vaccines did work. The first two doses had good data. Why couldn't we have had the same standard for the booster as we did the first two doses? Um, you know, it's not, I mean, the, the only explanation is, I guess that's the question, which is why did they approve the bivalent booster based on mouse data? It can't be money. It can't be time because look how fast the first trial accrued. You know, it's got to be avarice. It's got to be stupidity. I mean, what is the explanation? I mean, I truly don't know what, I mean, what do people think the explanation is? I, I don't think it's avarice. Uh, I think that's a bit strong. Um, and uh, I, I think that most people in this space uh, feel more like me, where they really think that there's a benefit for a segment of the population. And I think that there's been a movement to be less nuanced in how we recommend things. And I think that that has been damaging. But, but Mike, I, like they, I definitely think people agree with you about what it does. But my question is, why, if let's say you're an FDA, you could have shown that in October. Like, I mean, you, you could have just made them do the study. Why didn't they make them do the study? You would have been right. You'd have been vindicated. You'd know the point estimate is exactly blah, 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 you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I don't have a great answer for yeah. why exactly they didn't do it. <laughs> I will say that I don't think that it's avarice. I don't think anyone is out there trying to cause harm. Uh, no, I, do I guess avarice meaning greed. I mean, I like the fight company yeah, wants to make yes. money. For sure, and, sure. And then, and then the I people. Don't, I don't think that it's the. I don't think the politicians are necessarily. Uh, have I think the, the companies certainly. And but, and I, but I just put my what I actually think. Ja and and Peter Marks in five years they're going to be consulting for these companies. I mean, this is we we documented this in BMJ that when they leave FDA they go to the company and so their incentive is to play ball with the company. They they they'll have more meetings with Borla than they will with people like me. You know that's just the reality. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, go on. The next that topic. Does no, that does seem reasonable. I, I think that the prudential question is problematic. I, I agree that you're a small blip. And I think that, you know, I've been fighting the good fight, trying to encourage vaccination for a long time. And no one has ever mentioned your name as a reason that they're not getting vaccinated. Um, people have often mentioned many of the things that you said as direct reasons for why they're hesitant or untrusting of the system. And I think that we need to acknowledge that and be a little more transparent about it. But I will still say that there is a prudential question here where you don't want to be on the side of contributing to it not happening. So we, we leave it in that and I'll, I'll take a step back and we'll talk about observational data. All right. So uh, for observational data, I tweeted that I was coming at you and you tweeted back and I'm going to quote you here. You said, I agree 100 percent that merely being an RCT does not make you a good or useful RCT. You said, I disagree slightly that slightly that any other study design is useful for causal inference about therapies. Prognosis, yes. Harms, actually pretty decent. Efficacy, no. This is a bold statement. And I'm, I don't think you're just making a technical point about efficacy and effectiveness. 
I think you're making the general point that observational data is not useful for efficacy. So uh, tell me yes. about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, okay. Well, one, I like your post. And you. <laughs> you and you and I are in simpatico on one thing, which is that, you know, there is a deluge of randomized control trials that are no good. The control arm is not what you do in clinic. The dosing is not what you'd give. They have imbalances in censoring and dropout. There's informative sense. Okay. So we agree. Merely being randomized doesn't make you good. Check. Mm -hmm. Then the next question is observational studies. Let's concede. I think the reason that is discussion devolves is that they have many purposes. Um, many of the purposes are very good. And by the way, side note, I think I'm the author of 200 observational studies. I mean, let's be honest, look at my CV, it's 200 observational. So I mean, I made a career out of this. Yeah. What are they good for? One, prognosis, two, natural history, three, risk scores. Okay, now let's get into causality. Can observational studies tell you causality? Let's, let's make some distinctions. One, can they tell you causality about harm? All the myocarditis data we're quoting is observational data about harm. Can they tell you causality about benefit? Uh, and then the next line of questions is, what about natural experiment versus observational studies where we control for confounding? Natural experiments are things where there's regression discontinuity at the age of 74, 75, or in Spain, the regression discontinuity on masking five and six-year-olds. They do it for six, but not five, so we can yeah. look for art. Okay, so those. So I, I tend to think natural experiments have some causal validity. Um, let's talk about harms. I think John Yonides showed nicely, maybe about 15 years ago, that observational studies nicely recapitulate harms of randomized control trials. There's a pretty good concordance. In terms of F benefit, that's where I think they haven't yet proven themselves. Points of data. They're the two famous papers by uh, uh, John Concato and Benson. Paired New England Journal 2000 showed high concordance. John Yonides came back a year later in JAMA and he showed actually with a broader data set there's discordance. By this we mean in the subset of questions for which randomized trials and observational studies both exist, is there agreement? But that subset is not is a very select subset. It's a unique set of questions for which they're both. Okay, so for years we've debated. There's a paper by Sony, maybe 2012 JCO, that showed more discordance. But then finally in 2020, Kumar from UCSD, they did something clever. They took 120 randomized control trials from guidelines. For each one, they conducted a propensity score weighted observational study. So now there's no selection bias. They've actually done the observational study for all the things. And they actually find pretty bad discordance. And it tends to be upwardly biased. So in other words, um, if the observational study is positive, it's like 50% likely to be true in the randomized trial. But if it's negative, it's like 67% likely to be negative in the randomized, you know, so negative results tend to dominate. Okay, so that's the data point. And then the final data point I would say for you is, you're gonna say Miguel Hernan causal, you know, target trial. <laughs> I think you're gonna say that. Um, and I would say like, I, Miguel has done a great job of advertising his great paper. So he has a good one on hormone replacement therapy, statins and cancer. And what I would say is, these are just N of 1, N of 1, N of 1. He's recapitulated a randomized trial. I give him that. But what happens if you take 100 randomized studies and try to recapitulate them? And the FDA did commission the project. It's called RCT Duplicate. They literally asked Sebastian Schneidelweiss from Harvard to recapitulate a set of randomized trials because they want to use real-world evidence. That result so far has been disappointing. It's in Jack. Um, it hasn't yet recapitulated it. So for all these reasons, my conclusion is I tend not to trust it for efficacy. Let me look at my notes here. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the work of Miguel Hernan? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I read All his right. book. So, okay. no, let's let's get into this. So, I mean, I think that there's a couple problems, and I find the work in the early 2000s pretty unconvincing. And um, there's a very nice 2018 paper with Jennifer Gill as an author that I think you wrote. Um, and it's entitled "Improving Observational Studies in the Era of Big Data." And I think you hit on the three big problems, which are residual confounding, time issues, and multiplicity. I think those three things are the reason that a lot of observational data has been untrustworthy bunk. And we agree on that because it's what you wrote. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I, I let me let me hit residual confounding first, which and and I think that you're a little too pessimistic about that. Um, and so when I, when I teach this, I talk about acai berries because I love acai berries. I don't eat them unless they're covered in chocolate. But um, I think that they're a good example of this. You know, well, you can imagine acai beer, berries causing lower cardiovascular mortality or whatever. Um, and you can imagine confounders like socioeconomic status 
um, that we can measure. But then there's all these unmeasured confounders, right? There's how much yoga you do, how crunchy you are, you know, how many times you drink alkaline water per day. Uh, and and it's, really hard to, it's really hard to measure those things, right? But you don't you don't need to measure all of them because all of those confounders are associated with each other. Right. And so if you just measure yoga participation, you actually get a pretty good surrogate for alkaline water intake and crunchiness. Right. And so why why isn't the solution just to do a better job of getting more confounders and doing a better job of propensity matching on them pick your pick your adjustment to your um why isn't why isn't the answer just to do a better job of catching these confounders and getting fewer and fewer unmeasured confounders i guess the answer is to that question is that will help you i do think yeah. and then the other answer question is like is there a philosophical barrier like in the sense is it impossible for observational studies to be reliable my answer is no it is as you articulate it is absolutely possible that in 2020 you know 2040 we will have a method to have very high quality reliable observational studies yeah and maybe if you solve these problems times zero confounding okay but all i'm saying is that for me to be validated you take a hundred randomized trials and you show me your method has 99 percent concordance i'm sold but they haven't done that yet um, and so that's my root of my argument is that they haven't done that yet. Um, but your point is well taken that it oughtn't be so hard. Now, if, okay, go on. No, no, no. And I was going to say, I mean, I think that the time zero problem, this is why you, that's the really hard one. That's the hard nut to crack. Yeah. And this is, and I think that it's easier with like new user designs. You can get at it. But so, so for your, for your listeners, like the time zero problem is that, you know, in a randomized controlled trial, you randomize people. And when you randomize people, the beauty is that you, you fix these unmeasured confounders. But the other beauty is that you make a time zero. Like this is the time, not when I give you the drug, this is the time that I intend to give you the drug. And getting that intend to give you the drug is incredibly difficult in observational research. Uh, and I think that Miguel Hernan's group is doing a lot to try and get to that. I'm tr I, it, It's very challenging. I mean, I do observational research and I, I, I don't think I've ever fully done a, a brilliant job of adjusting for it but it's not always a huge problem that manuscript that you that we're that hit the twitters recently about paxlovid was just such a farce um and that was an example though of how the, the one that topo promoted yes yeah the, the yes. topo one your your tweet i have this down here as well because it's great this is your quote great study shows paxlovid works even before you take the first pill <laughs> um, which was pretty accurate if you look at the kaplan meyer curve at day zero before the patient got the pill they had a mortality benefit or a benefit to severe and outcomes whatever hospitalization so, yeah hospitalization. And, and, and and that's a time zero problem because they're not starting yeah. the same time right it, it's completely ridiculous but this is an example of how like these problems are fixable. Like that study didn't have to be run that way. And the problem is so obvious that it should have been done differently, right? Okay. So that's okay. why I'm more Totally optimistic. agree. Okay, yeah. so there's somebody in my, who research, I do research with, Tracy Beth Hogg. She has exactly your point of view. And I actually, I'm not in disagreement with you, which is in the sense that like, are these problems fixable? Yes. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that I will, I will say, Ivan I Prasad will believe, but you know, I'll change my pledge and say, instead of randomized data and observational studies, the moment somebody does project RCT, replicate, maybe not duplicate, you take 100 ongoing RCTs. You have to pick RCTs that you don't know the answer to. Because once you know what you're aiming for, you know, it's a little bit easier. You pick randomized trials you don't know the answer for, and simultaneously you run observational studies, and you look at the concordance. Okay, but two more things on this topic, since you're gonna, you're gonna like this. You haven't seen my paper, Reliable, Cheap, Fast, and Few? I have actually. Okay. Okay. About how we should just randomize people because it's quicker and it's yes. actually cheaper. Right. I, I so, read that one. It's good. Okay. Okay. I liked it. So, so, so that's my next <laughs> argument, which is that even if you solve the concordance problem, which is about the reliability of the answer, there's the question of how many people have to be exposed to the ultimately futile arm. And my yeah. point is actually randomization is minimizes that because in real world observational data sets, about 15 times as many people get something and don't get something before we actually go and run the answer. So it actually streamlines that in terms of cost, you know, okay. Anyway, you saw so, it. That, that, so this is aside the point. I want to get back to challenge you on some empirical yes. evidence. Go on. But before I get back to that, you know, this is a specialty perspe specific perspective. Like you are correct in cardiology and oncology. But man, in rheumatology, I'm just not getting studies like that no matter what. And a lot of the drugs, like it would be cheaper to look at whether azathioprine or methotrexate is more effective for the treatment of myositis, but uh, it, it's not going to be cheaper in an RCT. Like we, we're already doing it. The drugs are 
dirt cheap. Like the observational data, I think, is where we're going to get, you know. I want to do pragmatic trials in that too. But anyways, totally. In my paper, I have a table that if the drugs are both generic, it's cheaper to do observational. And it, they, there's a, I think it's $8,300 per month per year or per month where it t- the scale tips. So there's yeah. some tipping point. You're absolutely right. It depends on the field. Um, it's easy for me to critique papers that I've read. <laughs> I'm gl- I appreciate, you, right. you know, the, uh, there's only three people who ever read that paper, by yeah. the way. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. I liked it. All right. So let me go and challenge the empirical data here for a second. So, and, and I, I think that the early 2000s stuff is unconvincing because I think a lot of that data was just bad. Sure. Um, I thought that the mid 2010s work. So Cochrane dove into this and theirs was actually not that discouraging. And then Ioannidis dove into it and his actually wasn't that discouraging either. He had a an ROR, which is a, you know, a relative odds ratio between the two of um, like 1.2 or something. So not, not, Terrible, actually. But you're right. Observational data is systemically overestimated. But so let me ask you a question first. If we had 10 RCTs, we're going to take 10 because that's what's been published from RCT duplicate so far. And then we ran confirmatory RCTs. How many of them do you think would have the same effect size and the same statistical significance? (laughs) That's actually a good question. And actually, there is a way to get at that. Probably, you know, the paper by Tiago Pereira, JAMA, uh, large effect sizes. Uh, basically, John and Tiago scraped all of Cochrane, 200,000 randomized trials, 81,000 clinical questions, and they looked at the subgroup where the initial randomized study had odds ratio 5 or larger or 0.05, you know, or 0.05 or smaller, so big effects, and then they traced the meta-analytic estimate over time with additional studies, and the answer to your question is, yes, obviously, everything regresses regresses to the mean, which I, which usually means it regresses to the true point estimate, which usually means the initial point estimate is an exaggerated effect. Um, so that's one. So your point is with, with more trials, effect sizes should get smaller. But Mike, I haven't written this paper yet, but we're going to write this paper. Right, now somebody's going to scoop me. <laughs> but the, the, the paper is going to actually be that in some disciplines, we should always be randomizing. Like we should just always be doing randomized studies, even when we think we know the answer. Because to your point, that subsequent randomized data will attenuate the estimate, get you a better estimate. And in some fields like aspirin for primary prevention, as populations change, the point estimate will go from favorable to decrement, detrimental. I think that there's this sort of, you know, does evidence have an expiration date? For some, I won't tell you exactly the subgroup of questions that we're going to write in the paper, but for some particular subgroup of questions, ran, like it should always be under the auspices of randomization. Anyway, that's sort of, you know, my heretical view on the topic. But you're absolutely right that even randomized trials won't replicate randomized trials perfectly. Yeah, and I think that that's what, so, and this is my experience recently. So in rheumatology, we just had this TULIP-1 study, which is a randomized controlled trial of anaphrolamab in the treatment of lupus. And it was a big failure. Um, you know, SRI-4, which is a completely unintelligible outcome measure, um, to no difference whatsoever. But they ran the TULIP-2 study at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And the TULIP-2 study, you know, halfway through, they're like, never mind. We don't love SRI-4. We're going to use the BICLA, which is even less intelligible. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, three months after the publication of TULIP-1, same drug, same patient population, same authors. Uh, and they found completely different results. You know, lo and behold, it was successful, published in the New England Journal of Medicine this time. And, you know, it's now it's FDA approved. And so at least in my experience over the past like couple of years, RCTs aren't even duplicating that much. And so the RCT duplicate study that you, you're talking about, I love. I think it's amazing. It's a great idea. Good use of, of, of uh, funding dollars. And, you know, so it, I don't know if it failed as much as you say it did. So, like, when you look at their data, they tried to, so for people who don't aren't familiar with this, like, they, they tried, they took 10 trials in cardiology, and they did a bunch of, they took the trials that were either ongoing or completed. So not all of them, I don't think we knew the answer to all of them yet. Correct, so it was fair enough. Replicate, like you said. And they uh, used their usual data, Optum, market scan, et cetera. Um, and then they they pre-register their analysis plans and they used all the novel, you know, time zero, new user designs, propensity score matching. They did all the good stuff. And your point is that they didn't hit 10 out of 10, which is totally fair. Um, six out of 10, they had agreement on effect size and significance. But, you know, eight out of 10, their answer fell within the confidence intervals of the RCT, you know? So it's not that their observational data was completely different. It, it landed within the expected effect estimates. And um, to me, that looked like a success, actually. So am I, am I wrong? Is that not a qualified success? 
<laughs> I guess, you know, the truth is we'll see what happens when they publish their further update. Yes. To me, as much as we hate to say, I know, we hate dichotomization, we hate binaries, but at the end of the day, medicine is binary, and so what is the take-home message? Will you do it or not do it? Uh, for me, I use the 6 out of 10. Um, that's a lot of disagreement in my mind. But, you know, I, we'll see where they go. Your point's well taken. Is the glass half full or half empty? My point is it's not to the brim, and I need it to the brim. Uh, and, but go on. I think that should be to the brim of where RCTs should land. And so this mm. is why I asked you. If I gave you 10 RCTs and I had you replicate with 10 more RCTs, how many would land in the interval and with the same significance? And it's not going to be 10. Okay. I, I don't I, know. If I, be I, I hear you. Like uh, Justice would say it should not be held to a higher standard than even randomized eight trials. Exactly. Okay. But what I would argue to you is that even that needs to improve. Okay. And what do I mean by that? Um, I, I guess let's just step back. What is the goal of this whole enterprise? Uh, if the goal of the whole end, like, why do we even want reliable causal information? It's because we're spending a lot of money because we're spending one fifth of GDP. And so I'm happy to spend one fifth of GDP and I'm happy to tax everyone to spend it as long as we know we're doing things that benefit people. Um, and in my mind, this whole enterprise is geared around that fundamental motivation. And I think to your point, you know, for me, observational studies don't quite get me there. But to your point, do randomized trials get me there? And my answer is no as well. And that's why like maybe a third of my research portfolio is shitting on randomized. People don't see it that way. But you know, what we're doing is we're saying the control arm should be different. We have all these papers coming on power calculation should be different. You know, underpowered studies helping nobody because it's like, as you point out, if you run a bunch of underpowered studies, your conclusions are just gonna be as bad as coin flips. I mean, it's gonna be crazy. And yet that's what they're doing. Um, I do think you're getting at the issue of like multiplicity and randomized studies. like. Yeah. It never used to be a problem, but it is a problem now because they have like tulip one, tulip two. In oncology, they're running tulip tw 222. That's called a vast. We have every tulip, you know, and then we pick, we cherry pick and we say, oh, of, we actually say this. We run like 100 randomized trials with a vast in. And then we say it works with carbopaclitaxel, but not cisgem because cisgem is a stronger backbone in lung. And in another cancer, it works with, you know, different backbone, but not the other backbone. We're, it's what, what the most parsimonious story is it's like doesn't work at all, right? Um, but your point is well taken. Look, yeah. Is randomized trial perfect? No. I just think we have to aspire for better in every domain, but go on. You know, I, I think that that's kind of the crux of my point, which is that I think that the, the bar shouldn't be perfection. The bar should be, is this reasonably close to the best we could do given our preferred methodology, which would be a randomized trial. And if, and if, and if an observational data is consistently getting us, you know, within the ballpark, when you do it right, then I think the answer isn't to say that we can't trust observational data at all. The answer is to say, you know, we trust observational data when it's done correctly. And, um, you know, correctly being a very loaded term and everyone thinks their own methods are correct. But I think that and, that's my kind of broader picture. Yeah. And just to tie it back to the boosters and masking, yeah. I, I would just say, you know, a listener can agree with Mike on that point while still feeling differently about these two examples, just because the confounding is really, I think, unprecedented difference. Like, who's not masking? Republicans. You know what I mean? I mean, like, who? it pairs with who's not masking? People who are not vaccinating. You, we talk about Pima and Maricopa County. Are we going to talk about masking? My favorite. We can talk about that next. I was just okay. going to have time I got, I got masking questions for you, too. All right. All right. Um, but the, anyway, but boosters. I want you to bring it back to boosters. Yeah. Healthy, the the healthy vaccinee effect, I think, is going to be unprecedented. That people who are getting... People who are getting boosters, they're also, they don't participate in society in the same way. They're much more precautious in a million ways from like what they're choosing to do and go out. Their exposure variable is different. Um, so anyway, so I mean, I really don't put much stock in the, I mean, I guess that's the, that's the core of our difference is mm -hmm. that you put more stock in it than I do. But the yeah. one thing we agree on is why did he let them get away with it? <laughs> okay, go on, go on. We both agree that we should be running trials. But I think that we are fundamentally disagreeing about the value of observational research. And I think our priors are actually more similar than they thought I thought they were. Uh, my prior is that, um, you know, boosting would be beneficial for an older person, especially with comorbidities, especially with immunosuppression. And the observational data somewhat consistently agreeing with that, even with me saying, I'm sure that's confounded. Uh, I still feel like that's enough for me to say that's a valuable intervention for that person. Now, is that a value? Is that is that the bar necessary for regulatory approval? I don't think that I'm um, on board for that indefinitely, but sure. I think that I'm I'll settle with that. I mean, and and again, you know, I think I did this game with Katie Sharf, the ID doctor, and we're like, oh, you know, 
70 year old guy comes in with, you know, a TNF alpha, do you boot, you know, we're like, yes, we like, I think most doctors will agree on, you know, okay, but yeah. go on. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's finish up with masking and then we'll call it a day. I eh? uh, see how much trouble we can get in one time. All right. So, you know, I, I think that uh, the masking debate has been kicked back to the fore with this Cochrane <laughs> review, which everyone used to like, and now they don't like so much. <laughs> yeah. They don't like it. I'm going to quote here from their review that said, um, and I quote, they said, there is uncertainty about the effects of masks. Um, the pooled results of RCTs did not show a clear reduction in respiratory viral infection with the use of medical surgical masks. There were no clear differences between the use of medical surgical masks compared with N95 P2 respirators and healthcare workers when used in routine, routine care to reduce respiratory viral infection. End quote. So that so that that flies in the face of you know the certainly the Twitter discourse and you know in in general I think the perspective that we've had towards masks. So first I just want to hear you respond to that 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 statement and just give some quick thoughts on the the Cochrane review before we dive into why I don't think that it it proves what I feel like others do. So go. <laughs> okay, I guess what would I say? And one thing of bias is that you know I didn't do the Cochrane review. Tom Jefferson did. But I did a review, systematic review with um, yeah. uh, 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 Jonathan yep. Darrow and uh, Ian Liu uh, that we published in Cato, and that'll be coming in a manuscript forthcoming. <clears throat> um, I mean, I don't know where to start. I guess I'd say, like, you know, the first question is, can you randomize populations to mask either individual or cluster? My answer is yes. We've done it 16 times pre-COVID, at least three times during COVID. Um, so is there equipoise to do it? Well, we did it at least three times during COVID. So somebody thought there was equipoise, Bangladesh and Guinea-Bissau and Denmark. Uh, if you pool all the randomized studies, you get a wide conference interval, 0.72 to 1.42. We can talk about that. Uh, if you pool all the ivermectin studies, you get a wide conference interval, 0.72 to 1 point. Uh, that's what I did too, just to prove a point. Um, I think both don't work. I mean, the burden is on the proponent to show how it does work. Uh, I think we should have had many, many more randomized trials. We should have randomized trials of children, adults, Cluster randomized trials. I think Fauci and and Rochelle failed in this. Um, I think Cochrane is saying two things. One, um, for the time being, we don't have evidence that it does work. And two, we should have done more studies. I think that they also say that. I think that's right. And um, they put zero weight in observational studies. Yeah, which is the crux of the one of the one of the problems, in my opinion. I but I think there's a couple other problems with uh, applying this to reality today. You know, one problem that there is not, which everyone seems to be obsessed with, is mask adherence. And I think you and many others have been appropriately um, discounted of that as a limitation. So right. I want to give you a chance to say why why mask adherence is obviously a silly reason to discount this data yeah i guess the simple answer is that like adherence is built into your recommendation i mean if i was saying if i was running a diet and my diet is hey you want to lose weight just don't eat anything and then you're like oh you know i tried your diet but by the way i got hungry in the evening and i had to eat something and it didn't work for me and it doesn't work for thousands of people you know you can't just blame the person and say you were not adherent to it what you had proposed was something that human beings cannot adhere to so adherence you own the adherence like if you think masking would work with better adherence, you have to show what it would take to get better adherence. So like we randomize places to mask or no mask and also an education campaign and free masking. And, you know, we motivated them in, you know, with financial incentive or color, you know, uh, Jed or Abeluk, um, he did a lot of things in his, Jason Abeluk, Abeluk did a lot of things in his Bangladesh study to incentivize adherence. So I guess I think that's a simple reason that, you know, uh, a drug is only good if you take it. If it, if you take a drug and you feel horrible side effects, you don't take it. You can't blame the patient for not taking it. And you know, I guess that's the gist of the argument. I don't know how, how would you put it. This adherence. yeah, no, I think that's the way. I think that's I think saying it's baked into the cake is a good yeah. way to say it succinctly. That um, adherence is baked into the cake of any public health intervention. So if you say this is my public health intervention, it works great, but for all the people, then that's like that's a very silly perspective to come from. Um, you know, public health interventions live and die by adherence, and so it's just it's baked into the cake. Uh, so I don't think that that's a good reason to say that the RCTs don't necessarily apply. Now I think that the spectrum of studies is is a, a good is a good reason. So, you know, I, I want to stay away from things that we're not doing anymore. So like community level masking is currently not in vogue and uh, most schools have moved beyond it. But the thing that we're still doing is masking in the healthcare setting. So what are your thoughts on masking in hospitals today? Yeah. Okay. You move beyond the two things that I have a vendetta on. Okay, fine. <laughs> but I, I also disagree. Well, that, those are easy. I want to put you a challenge here. Okay. Here's my argument to you and we'll see what you think. Um, 
okay, let's say hypothetically, we agree that masking lowers transmission. Hypothetically, I don't believe that to be true, but let's say it does. Okay, uh, both in the community and in healthcare worker settings. Uh, neither of us would believe it works 100%, obviously. Otherwise, then, you know, right. So it's going to be something like 5 to 10%. I don't know. We'll pick a number, 5 to 10%. In my mind, that is extremely useful prior to vaccination. Like if it worked, we do it before vaccines. Then we all have an opportunity to get vaccinated. And then, okay, got to get, you know, then the question is after vaccination, I guess there's an assumption built into it, which is that after you've had widespread vaccination and boosting, it is, it is to your benefit to delay the time until you meet COVID. Um, and that is a questionable assumption, I think, in a number of ways. One, this guy on my podcast, uh, Zebiem Rojic, he argues and he believes um, it might even be best to get it at a four months after your last dose. It might be better than eight months after the last dose when, you know, there's more, uh, you know, uh, the antibodies have further waned. I mean, this is an um, – who knows the answer to the question? The next yeah. answer to the question is, okay, if you're, if you're going to be around for 20 years – you're going to get it six times. If you're going to be around for 40 years, you're going to get it eight times. And, you know, and, and this point, so back to your hospital question. Yes, some hospital patients are very vulnerable. And yes, patients are free to choose to do whatever they want to do. And some hospital patients do wear N95s even in their room. To be honest, most, when my eyeball, when I walk around the hospital and I've been on, you know, I do 14 weeks of inpatient, most people don't seem to be wanting to wear it. The patient who's in me to come, they don't seem to give a, a shit about it, you know, to be honest, in my opinion. I mean, then I'm in the VI, I'm at county, nobody seems to, the patient doesn't care. Um, in fact, the patient most often asks me to take my mask because they can't hear what I'm saying and want to read my lips, etc. cetera. Um, I've had COVID before. I've had three boosters. I have three shots. I've had COVID. Um, you know, it's unlikely that I'm going to have it. And, uh, but the bigger thing is, is like, I, I, I think like, what do we, I don't know. I'll say the same thing the security guard said to me. You know, like, what am I doing here? Like, why are we, we're like policing this thing. I'm totally okay with like, you know, just like you can choose to wear a bow tie if you want. And I hate bow tie. Okay, no, you know what I mean? People wear bow ties, wear bow tie. You want to wear an N95, wear an N95. But we are making this policy. We've never run a randomized study to ever show it works. And at this point, I don't even think it makes sense because most of the patients have had COVID anyway. And if they haven't had COVID, they're going to get COVID. Um, if they if they're going to be around, you know, and so I guess that's uh, that's the gist of my argument. Um, anyway, okay. Yeah, so let me give you two thoughts. You know, the first one, and one question before I go on. So, do you think that, that masks have any benefit at all, like in any scenario? I would say all community recommendations probably zero, so just because. Yeah. yeah, cloth yeah. zero, surgical. I think it to me it's plausible that if you and I are in a room together for less than five minutes, there'll be some benefit. But with, with more and more time in the room together, I think that kind of washes, like to me, I think it's stupid that like, you know, if 10 of us sit in the same workroom for eight hours, all that air is gonna get exchanged. You know, this, I'm like, what are we doing here? Okay, uh, N95's tightly fitting um, in a short period of time with somebody who has it, that to me is the most plausible. And so that's where I think it makes sense to do. Although I wouldn't want to do it now anymore because I'd be happy to, you know, I, if somebody has COVID, I've had COVID. I'm not afraid of more COVID. I'm going to get COVID many more times in my life. It's only a matter of time. Um, I don't think I'll get it that day. But, yeah, I'd be, I'd be genuinely shocked if N95s didn't, didn't have a substantial benefit. But not with, I, your, I, not I, with your beard. Yeah, it's not going to work at all. Uh, no, but I also think that your point that they're enormously uncomfortable when worn correctly is they're, 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 it's not reasonable to do an N95. Uh, but so, so, and this gets to my point, which is that I think that the the a we should be run, we should run trials. I mean, I think we're all, we're both heavily in agreement on that. But I I, I think that uh, when I think pre pandemic, um, the number of times that I saw another doctor or myself or a nurse just in the hospital, sick as a dog, sneezing everywhere, coughing on people. And I, I just think that that was wrong. <laughs> and I think that we were insufficiently uh, comfortable requiring masks for people who are obviously sick. And I, I really think that requiring masks for anyone who's symptomatic um, would have been a very reasonable policy back then. And I, I think there'd be very reasonable policy right now. So, or no, even better, they shouldn't be there. I mean, what kind of not being yeah, there? Okay, yeah. I mean, obviously, that would be the, the the gold standard is to let healthcare providers not come in sick. But you know, th this is a really hard thing about medicine, which is that it's a zero sum game. And if you call in sick, your colleagues have to cover for you, or you have to cover for yourself by paying vacation back later. And the business majors love that scenario, and it's not gonna it's not gonna change. But, I guess um, to to your point, I guess I agree with you. 
but I don't think one needs a mandate for that because I do think most people's heart in the right. I mean, if I'm really coughing and I'm sick, I'm going to wear, you know, because I don't want to kill some. I mean, you know, I don't want to be the like literally knowingly doing it. Um, for sure. Yeah. I just think that like the current situation, obviously there's some drawbacks to having all providers masked. I think it definitely impacts patient experience negatively. It definitely impacts building relationships negatively. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that there's a positive to be gained by not having sick doctors roaming around sneezing on people. But so so last thing I have one, I have a treat for you. So I um, I, I calculated, I, I did a power calculation for our masking study in, in the healthcare setting. Oh, good. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Assuming that we um, have 5% of patients in the non-masked hospital, we're going to do a cluster RCT of hospitals or clinics or something. We're going to mask providers and we're going to see the patients. And if 5% in the non-masked group develop symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 and 1% in the masked group develop it, so about 4% absolute risk reduction, how many patients do you think we'd need uh, to run that trial? What you, if you were to guess power calculation? How many clusters, how many patients? Uh, ooh, good. This should be patient level. So we'll do a patient level. We'll do a couple of things. Yeah. So okay, patient. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, the problem. That's more complicated. Five to one percent. Yep. Twenty thousand. Yeah, a little, a little bit less. Depends on how you depends on how you bend the numbers. But yeah, between five to ten thousand. I think you can oh, probably get better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if you give a eighty percent eighty power and it seems to love point oh five. All right. So I think we should do it. I think it'd be really interesting. Well, so then I want to make one point here. Yeah. I think there are people who don't think you should do the study for all of these things. They don't think you can do cluster. I mean, I know they are. One is the CDC director. She testified in front of Congress this week, and she said, she was asked, you did not do any randomized controlled trials at all, the whole pandemic. Why? She said, I have no equipoise. What am I to think when I hear that? I mean, that to me is like, okay, you talk about lack of trust. I'm like, I can't trust her because I know that's not true. That Here's equipoise. She and I disagree. There's the equipoise. Um, I think there are people who think it would be unethical to do the randomized trial you propose. I mean, this is really one end of, I mean, I don't think they're an insignificant number. I think many of the people who wouldn't debate me hold the view that it would be unethical to do that randomized trial and we have to mask for, for the next thousand years. Um, that to me is a problem, but okay, anyway, we're, go with the direction you want to go. No, no, I think that's that that wraps up what I wanted to wanted to ask you about. I mean, I think that we were both in agreement that we should randomize more. Uh, one final question. I'm just curious because you uh, obviously do a lot of um, critical uh, criticizing of things, but also I think you have a fundamental optimism. So are you are you optimistic about the future of medicine right now or where where's your headland there? Yeah, I am an optimist. I don't know if people if you know that, but um. I mean, personality-wise, I'm always in a good mood. Yeah, mm -hmm. that comes through. And so yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Long term, are you are you are you long or short on medicine writ large? Well, I'm positive because, I mean, one, it's the greatest. You know, not to sound too cheesy, but it's the greatest job. It's a job where you actually like it. I mean. Not to shit on these tech people, but I'm gonna shit on them. I mean, these tech people tell me what they do. I don't know what the fuck you're. What the fuck are you talking about? I don't even know what you do. I don't know who gives a shit. Who, it's not about people's lives. What we do matters. It really matters. It matters. It's about life. It's about having kids. It's about living and dying. It's about your quality of life. It really matters. The stakes matter. I love that. The second thing I love. It's objective. Like, you know, I mean, there's some truth to the world. It's not just your feelings and my feelings. Like, we're trying to get at the truth. And whether we do an observational, randomized trial, the debate, why do we debate? Because we both agree there is a truth. There's a truth about these interventions, and we're both trying to get at it. We have different priors on how much we value different methods to get there, but we both agree that that is the goal, the truth about what makes people better off on these sorts of things, and that's so important. Then there's the human side of it. Every day I walk around. I talk to people. I look them in the face. I shake their hand. I put my hand on their shoulder. I do an exam on them. Uh, that's a privilege. They tell me things they've never told anybody. Um, they tell me th they, th they treat me like I'm like special, like I'm important. Um, and sometimes I know in a word I can do like what no pill can ever do. You know, I'm taking care of somebody who I don't want to get into the details, but he has something he's very worried about. And I just explained to him all that I know about it. He's like, you know what? I feel so much better. I, I was worrying about nothing, you know? And I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, you don't have to worry the way you were worrying. And like, I'm lifting this weight off him better than any SSRI ever could. Um, so that's a great thing. And that, you know, and then what is this thing I, we're fighting? You're fighting it to some, you, we have a, we're, we're both in the same space, which is, you know, what does it mean to pursue the medical truth? How should we do it? And it's a battle worth having. And to me, the pandemic brought out 
if I were to summarize what I think happened, it brought out the primitive instincts because people are individually scared. And when you are scared, it's, you know, masks are about my life and my safety and this is your bad person and you know you want us to die you're anti-mask and you know you're anti-booster you know everything becomes so moralistic and and emotional but that's finally starting to cool it's going to keep cooling i think we are going to be able to move make some agreements like you know to your fair compromise, like maybe boosters did work for older, frailer people, and maybe we didn't need to pursue it so doggedly in young people. Um, maybe we should have demanded more randomized studies. I think those are things that there'll be progress on. Um, it is a unique situation in medicine. In our whole medical career, doctors have never been personally afraid the way they have. And yeah. that, I mean, I've, ne you know, I've never seen it before. Even when Ebola hits, you, you know, I was at NIH when Ebola literally came in the door. But mm -hmm. we never thought we would actually, not me, and even HIV, which many doctors were scared of, um, very quickly, I think they felt like, well, you know, I'm not going to be getting it. And I think that's a diff psychologically very different than I could die of COVID. And I think that breaks brains. Um, no. Okay, I have a closing thought for you. Yeah, please. I was going to say that was a wonderful, beautiful closing <laughs> soliloquy. But yeah, let me know. What's your closing thought? Yeah. Okay. I think you did a great job. Okay. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe some me. listeners are going to put in the comments like, oh, not hard enough on him. You know, <laughs> you should, you quote, I think you did a fair job. Um, you can welcome back if they, if you want to go harder or go softer. Um, uh, okay. I think you were great. And I think you're a good host actually. So maybe you should. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Okay. Um, I think the conversation we just had, this is like, this is my number one point. I'm writing something about like errors. The number one public health error we had. The conversation you and I just had, we stopped having. I mean, I can tell you, I've been to all the grand rounds on COVID, all the, you know, hospital, you know, at, like sessions on it and all the emails I get. Universities, Stanford, UC, University of Chicago, UCLA, Harvard, UCSF, universities did not have these conversations. They just didn't. And you know what? To this day, that conversation we had about healthcare worker masking, you cannot have in my department. I don't think you can have it. People will be there shouting. They'll protest out front. They'll say you're murdering people, even having the debate, quote, both sides in. You're giving them a platform. This, this is a meta problem we're facing. I think it's going to kill us all. I mean, you're a good man to even, like, I, I really do worry. To me, the existential crisis is if everybody you disagree with is Darth Vader and everyone who agrees with you is Luke Skywalker, the world cannot be like that. Smart people who have both agree on good and, you know, what they want people to have like good lives will disagree about things. We have to have that dialogue. It has to be in universities. Podcasts have replaced universities. That to me is crazy. Okay, that's my closing thought. Yeah, I'm more optimistic about that. And I think that I have a broader feel towards um, good information winning out in the end. And, and whether that's coming from the ivory tower or coming from podcasts or a couple of people arguing about whether observational data has value. Um, I, I think that, that in the end, I think there's a slow trend towards um, knowledge improving. And so I think I'm a long-term optimist as well. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and say, thank you for letting me interview you. This was a lot of fun. Mike is a real pleasure.